Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. Here we are. It's a given Wednesday morning. Um, and uh, we have Michael C. Davis, Michael Curtis Davis, if you don't mind, uh, yeah. on the hookup from Washington. Michael has been on the show many times to discuss Hong Kong. We're calling this Global Connections. And we're talking about his new book, which is Making Hong Kong into China. I'll have to get him to describe exactly how that works. Uh, Michael has a long bio. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. And uh, I'm going to just tell you a couple of parts of it. He's a professor at Jindal University in India. He's uh, uh, at Columbia. Um, he's at the Woodrow Wilson Institute. Um, and there's one other. What was the one I missed, Michael? Well, I'm affiliated with the Weatherhead East Asia Institute and the Wilson Woodrow Wilson International Center in Washington, D.C. Uh, and I teach every spring a, a course in India where I'm a a professor of law and international affairs. And you spent decades teaching law in, in Hong Kong University, yes. uh, which is which was oh, drives yeah, us. Professor there now, actually. So, yeah. Okay. And I ask you about that. There's a certain risk in, in, attached in teaching at Hong Kong University right now. And maybe thank goodness for COVID, you can do it virtually. And that's not nearly the same risk. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> It's sad if this is the case, but it's, that's why I wrote the book. It's, it's a situation that's very con concerning. Let's talk about the book. Um, maybe we can show a copy of the cover of the book. Yeah. Um, so this is Making Hong Kong China. Um, and it's, it's about the, um, you know, the deterioration of the rule of law, deterioration of the freedom of speech um, and human rights in Hong Kong, which is a very sad story. And this book, uh, you know, I looked at it. It's um, it's it's um, an authoritative history, an authoritative analysis of wh what Hong Kong was uh, was intended to be over the under the handover and the basic law, um, and how that has uh, slipped and deteriorated over recent years. Uh, and so, this is an analysis of what happened and why. I don't I don't know if there's a lot of other books. A lot been written about Hong Kong. Michael, but the, you know this is very authoritative and very now. Um, so I, I wonder if you could tell us why you named it Making Hong Kong China. That's a very cryptic kind of title, I think. Oh, yes. And, and then, of course, the subtitle is very important to that, The Rollback of Human Rights and the Rule of Law. Yeah. So what I'm highlighting in that title is the, I, you know, the cost of Hong Kong becoming part of China. Uh, is the rollback of human rights and the rule of law. Uh, and I would argue in the book, of course, it wouldn't have to be that way. It could be otherwise, but it seems that the, the forces at power are uh, determined to uh, control and dominate Hong Kong in ways that are a problem. Now, you know, some people feel that uh, Xi Jinping and, and uh, Beijing have to do this. Why? Because there are you know, hundreds, thousands, even cities the size of Hong Kong within mainland China. Uh, they are concerned that if Hong Kong prevails in its its protest culture, as has been shown over the past few years, that that sort of sends, sets up a tinderbox uh, in mainland China, which will be a real handful for Beijing. And therefore, they have to do this. They have to suppress uh, human rights, the rule of law, in order to survive the country in general. What's your comment on that? I, I disagree with it. Uh, it's kind of like a husband who beats his wife saying, you made me do it. Uh, and <laughs> this, is, this is really really a sad, sad kind of way to look at it. Uh, they, they could have done things very differently. And I think when it comes to the mainland, if the Communist Party is determined to keep its grip on power, uh, in some ways by doing what it did in Hong Kong and repressing uh, protest and arresting people, it's actually drew more attention to Hong Kong uh, on the mainland. It's it's made the problems of, of repression in China, it's put them in the spotlight, the way the, the regime behaves. So people who may on a comfortable uh, Sunday morning in Shanghai think, well, life's okay, I've got a job and everything, uh, gets a, a, a chance to see just how uh, repressive this regime is. Uh, so I think what they've done is actually make things worse. I think before they started using these heavy-handed tactics 
most people on the mainland just view, viewed Hong Kong as someplace else, just like they viewed Japan and New York City as someplace else. And those people do what they do and they have what they have. And they, I, I don't think there was a, a, a jealousy or anything at all. In fact, people from the mainland, the biggest source of tourism for Hong Kong was the mainland. So they wanted to go there just like they, another big destination is Japan. Uh, they even go to Taiwan. They like to go to these places and enjoy those societies. But I don't think, I think if China is going to have a rebellion, it's not going to be caused in Hong Kong or Japan or New York. It's going to be caused there. Uh, and it's going to be grievances people have on the ground. So I just think this argument doesn't fly. Yeah, and uh, there's really, you know, that Beijing could have been so much more, what do you want to call it, tolerant of Hong Kong. Well, Hong Kong, as you suggested, is kind of a parallel society. It doesn't have to be merged in. It doesn't have to do lockstep uh, with the mainland. It has survived very well in a very you know, you know, agreeable basis for several years anyway, after the handover. And all of a sudden, somewhere along the line, I would imagine it's just around the time Xi Jinping took over, uh, Beijing got very aggressive and and started to you know rattle Hong Kong's cage, and and that is what has generated all the enmity. Am I right? Well, I think that's what's ratcheted up. And and the thing is, is as I uh, outlined in the book, a lot the roots of a lot of these problems go all the way back to the handover and before. Uh, it's kind of in Beijing's DNA to want to control everything. So they were trying to do that before the handover by rewarding their friends and pointing them to committees and, and that were in preparation for the handover and isolating their enemies uh, and so on. So all of that was going on. When the handover occurs, that gets increased. And then when they write this basic law, which they wrote actually in the late 80s and, and 1990 when they promulgated it, they built in a couple controls that have been the curse of Hong Kong ever since. One is they made it without any kind of uh, uh, you know, independent body that National People's Congress Standing Committee had the ultimate power of interpreting the basic law. Now I'd written a book back then where I argued that you could have a, a constitutional court or constitutional committee between the mainland and Hong Kong to resolve disputes in this autonomy arrangement they created a, a basic law committee, but then they made the committee basically operate in secret. Nobody supports, su submits anything to them except the MPC standing committee, which I assume submits a kind of orders to them as to what they're supposed to approve. And so that was one thing. And so that meant uh, very early on after the handover in 1999, the so-called famous right of abode case, uh, the Hong Kong court was not going to refer this court case to the Standing Committee for Interpretation. There's an article 158 in the basic law that says if matters involve local central relations or central authority, then the Court of Final Appeal would refer it. The government sought that referral and the court said, no, this is within our autonomy. So it asserted its autonomy. And then the government went around the court to Beijing and got the court overturned. And I think ever since then, the, the, the court, the independence of the judiciary, the court of a final appeals ability to decide important matters are, has been under threat. There's always this kind of background idea of Beijing criticisms going on about what's happening and so sort of pressure put on the court. So that's one flaw. And, and the other one is the, the basic law promised the ultimate aim of universal suffrage with gradual and orderly progress. Well, there's been no progress, gradual or otherwise. And they that and that's because they're using the interpretation power to say, well, no, this is not Hong Kong's not ready for this. And we know in 2014 and 15, when you and I talked about the umbrella movement, that they that Beijing had said, well, now you can have this universal suffrage, except they said it had to be uh, we choose the candidates and you, you can vote for which one you like. Uh, and so these two interferences have really stuck in the craw of Hong Kong people. Almost every protest in Hong Kong is in one way or another over this, mostly because the Hong Kong government therefore is selected effectively by Beijing, by a Beijing friendly committee. 
uh, that chooses the chief executive each time and, and then the officials in the government. And so the government is totally beholden to Beijing throughout all of these years. Whenever there's been protest, it's been because this government is doing things that Hong Kong people feel threatens its autonomy. And the people of Hong Kong are very much aware that the mainland system is very different. And so if they see the mainland system creeping across the border, they're gonna be upset. And so almost every protest in Hong Kong, if you sort of analyze it in depth, you conclude it's about this problem. So what you're saying is right, that in the last two years, this has become dramatically worse, but the roots for it are actually built into the system. And I try to outline that in the book. Yeah, you do, you have a, you have a chapter which asks the question whether the basic law is an enlightened commitment to, or a ruse. And yeah. of course, you know, the, the case can be made that it was never intended in, in a gen genuine, sincere fashion in the first place. Yeah, that's the problem. And, and well, we don't know. I, I never try to go with conspiracy theories. They were trying to cook the books before the books, before the deal was done. Uh, sometimes maybe Deng Xiaoping was sincere that, hey, this can work. And maybe if there were sincerity, but what I, I tend to think, and when I'm asked about this, is that it's kind of in the mainland government's DNA that they don't know how to run an open society. And if they had left it to an elected government in Hong Kong, then they would have been able to do it, I think, very peacefully. I don't think Hong Kong people have any, any uh, fight or with the mainland. They don't want to get in, involved in that because they can't win that. So basically, they would have gone on about their business. And, and if the basic law was carried out as it was promised, I don't think we would be where we are today. So in a way, going back to your first question, a lot of the troubles Beijing has and the examples that therefore are displayed worldwide for everyone to see uh, may cause them more problems at home than if they had just done this thing right. Yeah, I think maybe so. Yeah. Well, you have, you have a chapter here called... Uh, uh, how the government is taking revenge on the protesters after 2015. And, and query whether it's revenge or it's just tightening the screws. You have an authoritative, uh, uh, you know, author you have a, um, what do you want to call it, a, a, um, a, a autocrat government in, uh, in, in the mainland. And they're always, as you say, it's in their DNA to try to tighten the screws and make everybody, you know, subject to their control. Uh, is it revenge or is it just a march to greater control? Well, I think it's both. I think uh, that that's how they, they deal with people that disappoint them. But I think when you listen to mainland rhetoric, you know they're really disappointed. They don't get why Hong Kong people don't like them. <laughs> they actually want to be uh, this call for national education, which they actually formally pushed the Hong Kong government to do in 2012 which was when all these youngsters finally came out and opposed that, uh, the, the change in education, they thought it was gonna be brainwashing in Hong Kong. Uh, and this was all because there was a perception that in Beijing that, that Hong Kongers just don't appreciate the mainland and, and its history and, and so on, and they lack patriotism. And you see this running through this Hong Kong uh, uh, battle continuously that and, and so the more Beijing uh, you know tries to press its its tough love on Hong Kong, the more people rebel. Uh, and uh, I think this is what's produced a kind of Hong Kong identity that when I first was in Hong Kong way back in the 80s, I think Hong, in fact it was funny. I had a class I think you might have read this in the book. I had a class. And I asked him, do you want this? In 1985, I asked him, do you want this 1984 joint declaration? And, and uh, or if, if you had a choice, what would you do otherwise? And this class first refused my question. It was, he said, well, no one asked us. I said, okay, humor me. And, and their answer was, oh, let's return Hong Kong to China and then hire the British to run it. And, and this is... And so this, um, this is not an intensely rebellious political community. It's just a community that doesn't really trust the way Beijing runs things. And they, they know the British know how to do it. Uh, at the same time, they, there was an identity with China. I mean, you wouldn't need to return it at all if all you wanted is the British to run it. 
but there was this identification with China in this, among these students. I don't know how representative they are, but they were from middle class and lower working class homes. But you know, they, but what happens is China squanders this this good feeling, this aloha feeling towards the mainland. It gets squandered over the years uh, by all these tactics and uh, and really misleading and and aggressive statements and and disrespectful ways of treating Hong Kong people. So, uh, and then as this becomes real pressure with, you know, crackdowns and refusals to carry out the basic law, interference in the courts and this and that, uh, resentment builds up and people uh, start taking more seriously and appreciating more seriously who they are as people. So well, that's one of the threads, you know, you, you start out with a kind of a culture that's different than the mainland culture because of the, you know, the British influence there. Um, time goes by, young kids, they may not care at first, but they start caring and they become students and they care a little more. Um, and then it, it cycles up. And so, you know, if you think of those young people in the streets in uh, 2015 and thereafter, uh, they, they were not even born <laughs> at the right. time of the, of the handover, but things have happened in Hong Kong with respect to Chinese attempt to control, um, to, to, to proselytize them, to, to activate them, so to speak. And, yeah. uh, what you, and you were there, you've seen it, uh, you know, uh, accelerate. You've seen that generation accelerate. But let me, let me ask you this though. I mean, it's, it's kind of schizo in the sense that you have the, the people who are dependent on Hong Kong, that may mean a lot of business people, a lot of you know, Hong Kong companies, maybe international companies who would like to maintain friendly relations with Beijing. They don't want to be on the wrong side of this issue. And then you have these kids, students and young, and they're, they're not students anymore. They're older than that. They're in the workforce um, and they're very excited and upset about what is going on. Um, am I right though, is that not everybody in Hong Kong is a protester. Uh, and the protest is, you know, is a definable kind of uh, demograph. Uh, and, the, and they're not the same as the ones, you know, who, um, who, who would benefit by being friendly with Beijing. Well, this is the thing. Uh, when we've had votes, because uh, about half of the legislative council is directly elected. And so the votes that are uh, one man, one vote, or one person, one vote, directly elected, the hand democratic or the opposition camp, however you want to call them, tend to win about 50 to 60% of the vote. So that means about 40% uh, or so of the people support the pro-establishment camp or pro-Beijing camp. There's kind of a distinction between pro-establishment being more the business and uh, those kind of people, lawyers and professionals, and pro-Beijing being these a lot more grassroots organized labor unions and things that are, they're leftist labor unions and rightist labor unions in Hong Kong. So the leftist ones go, go with Beijing. And uh, we don't know what their sentiment is per se, as much as they're well organized. And, and, and the, the, the Communist Party uh, indirectly able to influence uh, the leaders of these more left side of, of the political spectrum. And then the, the so-called establishment, the business elites get rewarded for going along to get along. And so that's the one side of it. But the opposition has always been in the electoral majority. And then when you look at the protest on the street, I mean, typically I was involved with the Article 23 concern group years ago when we were uh, again at that time opposing uh, uh, national security laws. Uh, and, and there we had a half a million protesters. I think that even scared Beijing that, wow, you know, these people of Hong Kong are, are not going to take lying down whatever we're trying to do to them. And, and so uh, as time goes on, protests again in, in the 2012 over national education, again in 2014-15 over democracy. So uh, the protests keep getting bigger and bigger over time. So when we get to uh, 2019, in early June, I think it was June 9th, there was a million people marched on the street on June 16th, 2 million. Now, if you have a population of 7 million people and 2 million of them are on the street and they're mostly young people, then you're talking about someone from probably three-fourths of the families in Hong Kong is out on the street. 
So, so the support for the protest is rather dramatic. It's it, one person said the two million that marched in on in mid June might have been one of the largest protests in in the history of the world. So, so it's we're it, coming from a city that's locked in. It's like Hawaii, is, you know. It's there. It's a small territory. So, so that that is, uh, I think, an indication that there's widespread support. Uh, for the opposition camp, but now the crackdown is getting so severe, uh, we don't know what's going to happen. I mean, are people going to immigrate or are they going to quietly, uh, you know, uh, protest or try to push back and, you know, little by little, uh, what's going to happen? Are they give up? I don't know. That's one of the underlying questions of the book. I mean, what you know, what you have is a relentless effort by Beijing relentless and tough and smart and um, you know un unceasing uh, to try to undo the democratic trappings of Hong Kong one step at a time but always doing it and these kids these protesters they understand you have to give them enormous credit for seeing through that for not accepting it uh, and I wonder you know in this country whether we're as smart to deal with demagogues and autocrats uh, they they have never stopped. Uh, on the other hand, Beijing has never stopped either. And, uh, you know, at the bottom, I, what I get out of the book is it's not a good picture. You have uh, the national security law. And I guess this was published originally in October, October 9th, strikes me. Um, and after the national security law, we've had this uh, recent tragedy about uh, disqualifying four members of the Hong Kong legislature and throwing everything in a turmoil and ha having other people walk out and you know this is not good for autonomy or, or uh, independent government. Um, so it's actually declining. And um, I hate to say this, but Beijing is succeeding uh, as we go forward. And, and that's this, that's why we have to see the thread that you have written about. Yeah. No, it's interesting. And I tried to do that in the book to really trace that what's going on has been part of a a sort of pattern over time and to try to go through the stages of it, as you see in these chapters in the book, of what's happening. I don't view the book, I mean, the book is very critical. It's not anti-China. It, it, at its best, it would like to see things uh, improve and, and people understand what's happening. I, I, I don't think this had to be done this way, as some of your earlier questions suggested, that in fact, it's, 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 it's the opposite should have happened. Uh, and if I have to blame anyone, even my top of my list isn't China, but it's the pro-establishment camp in Hong Kong. I think uh, these people somehow, I guess, viewed that their position depended on pleasing Beijing. So they tended to overdo that part of it and not the part where they find their voice to represent Hong Kong concerns. So in the interim period before this universal suffrage was to be created, these people in effect were appointed to represent Hong Kong, but I don't think they did. Uh, I think if they had found their voice, I think May mainland officials might have been persuadable. And of course there wouldn't be all this contention on the street, which makes it difficult to persuade the mainland officials. Uh, if in fact uh, these Hong Kong officials help Beijing to understand uh, how to go about achieving exactly what's in the basic law. Uh, and I, I think a lot of international criticism now of China is not criticism that you have to be like us. It's criticism that you have to carry out your own basic law. Keep your uh, promise. Yeah, exactly. That's the nature of, of the criticism. Now, this is, of course, always attacked by Beijing because, oh, that's foreign interference. But but I, I think it's uh, it can be viewed as actually a constructive kind of uh, message, but uh, it seems that it, it falls on ten years right now. It's not uh, something that Beijing wants to hear, and, and uh, I think they probably do think a little like one of your questions suggested that well, if we give in to anything, then everything is going to come falling down on our heads. Uh, like they, they view the Soviet Union's experience as one they don't want to repeat. But in some ways, I feel they're almost repeating it. They're using hardline tactics up to the bloody end to the point where uh, people may 
if the if they their performance goes down, people may be frustrated with them. Yeah. History and, shows yeah. us that's not that's not sustainable. You know, you can't right. do that forever. One thing, uh, you know, this is Hong Kong is a special place. I don't have to tell you that. Uh, and mm -hmm. this book and the, the whole study of what's been going on since the uh, the handover uh, is a swirling mix of all these influences in, in various parts uh, that have ne never existed in any other place in the world. You have original Chinese, you have the whole uh, English empire, you have you know the British culture, the English culture that was left there, the English law system, the English um, you know, bureaucratic system. Uh, then you have China, which changes, which has changed enormously in the last, oh my God, in the last few decades. Um, you have the rest of the world watching. You have the, the, the business connections that Hong Kong has um, and the law in Hong Kong and the growing up of these kids. Um, you know, it, so many factors and variables all at play right now. Uh, it's, it's really remarkable. One of the chapters you have that interested me, because you and I have talked about it before, is the international reaction, international yeah. support for Hong Kong. I mean, in a large, in large part, they have left Beijing to its own devices. Nobody has really stepped in and yeah. castigated Beijing for. Am I right uh, for what they're doing in Hong Kong? Well, well, they didn't until this past couple of years. Of course, then we we've got a pushback against Beijing. Uh, I think the first part of what you were commenting on too, I, I'd like to emphasize. In fact, I start the book by saying, imagine a city like New York or London is suddenly taken over by a hardline regime, you know, and there's secret police and there's arrest of opposition and all of these things. And there, well, that city exists, it's Hong Kong. And I think Hong Kong is very much in that class. There's two or three cities in the world in this class. Uh, interestingly, New York is not the capital of this country either, right? It's, it's this financial cultural center, this buzzing beehive of human activity that all the world knows about. I, I went for a walk in Central Park with a friend from India recently, and uh, him and his wife, and, and his wife was just thrilled getting pictures taken everywhere. I've seen all these scenes in, in every movie, and she would mention which movies she saw that scene and so on. But it's like the world owns these special cities, and there are not a lot of them. There's just a few of them, and, and Hong Kong is one of them. So I think when Beijing destroys or brings that city to its knees, it, it's the world feels the pain. It, and I think that's that's the extraordinary part of Hong Kong. Oh, I think that's an extraordinary thought, Michael. You know, yeah. we, we're, we're all invested in Hong Kong. It, yeah. it is our city, it is a global city. We all have a piece of it. And now that's yeah. being taken away. Yeah, that, and that, that's, yeah, and that's the problem. And, and so what does the international community do? Well, of course, the big limitation is China is the big elephant in the room, right? It's this huge economy that everyone wanted and wants to participate in. Uh, and, and China, yeah, is an authoritarian regime. And that causes a lot of response all on its own without Hong Kong in the picture. Uh, you know, how do you deal with this regime? There was hope that it would evolve and become less uh, authoritarian and less autocratic and less imp imposing of its uh, ideas on the world, but the, the trajectory has been the opposite under Xi Jinping. So, you know, there's this trade war, there's this uh, kind of problems in the South China Sea on the border of India and this and that in Xinjiang. So China's kind of doing all it can to offend everyone. And in the midst of it is Hong Kong. You know, it's like the, the most, the jewel in the, in the, in the middle of the puzzle. You know, it's it's this uh, special place, and I think everyone's invested, so they want to do something. So in the in the U.S. Congress, there's the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, the Hong Kong Autonomy Act, uh, and there's these sanctions now. The U.S. is imposing on a list of a mainland official and, and Hong Kong officials, including the chief executive of Hong Kong. She can't uh, come to Hawaii on a holiday for now, uh, and those things are going on. And, and so, and then the British, you know, well, back when they handed Hong Kong over, they only gave Hong Kong people the so-called British overseas nationality, right? BNO, passports, it's called, British National Overseas. 
and which does not give them the right to move to Britain and stay there, right? And it was kind of an odd thing because Macanese and Macau, uh, who were under Portuguese colonialism, were given the full right to go live in Portugal as Portuguese citizens when the handover occurred, which created the paradox that they, when the UK was part of the European Union, that those Macanese could move to London <laughs> because they're EU citizens, uh, and yet Hong Kongers could not. So that was the situation until this year. And this year, with Beijing's crackdown, the British finally had to come up and, and put it up, and they did. They Now that these BNO passport holders can all move to, to the UK. And now, that's is it enough? Is it enough, Michael? I mean, is it enough to really make the point with Beijing that the world is watching and they really ought not to do this? Uh, and, it, and we do care about Hong Kong. We, we, we see Hong Kong as a global city. Um, can't we do more? Can't the international community do more? Can't the U.S. do more? Can't Joe Biden do more? Well, I think they can. It is mostly, I mean, and it is a frustrating thing. I've had conversations about this with lots of people. Uh, but I think the Trump, and you know, there's this a lot of media report about people in Asia and China, dissidents and in Hong Kong, uh, protesters supporting Trump because they like Trump's uh, bombastic language. They like the, the, the image of him standing up to Beijing. Of course, he didn't stand up to them very effectively was the problem. He, he didn't, he alienated his allies in Asia and, and the world at large. So he could never form a kind of united front. If he wants to put pressure on Beijing, he didn't have many tools in his hand because he couldn't get along with anyone. So a lot of talk and no action uh, when you really come down to it. And the trade uh, war has produced virtually nothing. I read an article just the other day that even the first stage agreement has not been carried out by Beijing. Beijing hasn't delivered as much as two thirds uh, of what it was supposed to buy, you know, in terms of buying. No, no of surprise, that. no surprise yeah. that they're thumbing their nose at Trump. Yeah. Right, and, and that's it. So, so the, the, obviously the, these protesters who like Trump were kind of misled. So the question is, can Biden do better? Now they worry because they say, well, the United States was always just sucking up to Beijing and letting him get away with whatever he wanted. And so they fear, well, if uh, a less bombastic leader takes up the White House, Maybe it'll be more of the same, you know, just uh, a little bit of talk, but no action. Uh, and, and I hope that's not the case. I think it, it, there's a good chance it won't be because when I've been on Capitol Hill, my sense is that people on both sides of the aisle have had enough of the Beijing game. And so I think there's, there's support for uh, a democratic leader in, in the White House to take a tough stand on China. And so that's what we're expecting. And then the question, and can he do more? Yes. If he does what I, what I just said, he's very much willing to work with his allies. So Biden could assemble enough uh, agreement among uh, dominant countries in the world uh, to, to push back effectively to impose some cost for what Beijing has been doing rather than uh, just all talk and, and no action. Uh, and so, so that I think is, is what uh, a lot of human rights people that work on the Hong Kong issue that I've talked to both over here in, in, in the US and, and in Hong Kong, that's what they're hoping for, that they will yeah. be a more consistent policy. We should, we uh, should all be hoping for that. So uh, uh, we're, we're, we're getting to the end of our time today, Michael, and I I, I, uh, I wanted to say that this was very readable. It's not a long book and it has notes. The notes are very impressive. You have, you have <laughs> notes that are very explanatory <laughs> and authoritative. So, you know, you can look at this book as either a, you know, a, a study that everyone can read uh, as a sort of a news, a news approach to things, or yeah. you can look at it as a, an, academics, an academic work just as well, a completely authoritative. But let's talk about uh, your conclusion because you've been you leading up to that now, and I asked you to identify a paragraph you could read, uh, you know, to best uh, to best describe how you want people to think about this and what your recommendations are for the possibilities going forward. Could you? Well, thank you, Jay. You asked me to read the last one, so I'll, I'll try to do that promptly. 
it, so it goes as follows, the last paragraph of the book. Finally, supporters of the national security law may argue that I present too dark an image of the risk to Hong Kong society under the national security law and its constitutional order. I have strongly urged that those in charge of these developments change course and return to the original commitments, both in letter and in spirit, made to Hong, Kong pe Hong Kong's people in the sign of British Joint Declaration and the Basic Law. A second best alternative to prove me wrong in such dark predictions would be for officials and judges at all levels to stand their ground and uphold the liberal commitments to Hong Kong, respecting the rule of law, human rights, and democratic reform as outlined in the basic law. Some may lose their jobs for such actions, but sometimes resistance drip by drip is the only path we each have to bring about change individually and collectively. Very wise, and it applies not only to Hong Kong, but to many other places in the world, including in some sense, the United States. We all have to do our part. Absolutely. We've all been on the edge of our chairs watching the shenanigans in Washington. In some ways, we're still on the edge of our chairs. <laughs> hoping somebody will get up and leave the White House. <laughs> and hoping your book, as so many other articles and books we've seen about these issues, about how you deal with autocracy, uh, you know, will we'll have some lasting effect uh, in various places, and especially in Hong Kong. Thank you so much, Michael. It's great You're to welcome. have you on the show. It's my pleasure. I'll we'll see talk you again. See you yeah. next time for sure. <laughs> Aloha.